What is going on YouTube, Lamont at large? Today I am in Farmville, Virginia. And the song that you listened to was called Voices by a horrorcore rapper by the name of Psycho Sam. Real name, Richard McCroskey. So, first of all, what is horrorcore? Now, if you go on Wikipedia, it's going to tell you some nonsense about it. But basically, I'm just going to break it down to you really quick. Horrorcore is basically you take a horror movie and you put it to music. It's basically the same thing. Um, if you like, for instance, Insane Clown Posse, I guess they would be... I guess you could put them in the genre of horrorcore. I've been a big fan of Insane Clown Posse ever since I was about 16. Uh, you got other bands, Murder Dolls, uh, the singer Wednesday 13. I guess you could put them in horrorcore. If you look at Wikipedia, it says it's music talking about killing people and, and raping women. And that's not really what it's about. I mean, there's a lot of killing and stuff in horrorcore. But of course, so there is also in horror movies. I mean, for instance, we like horror movies and Freddy Krueger, the most popular character in terms of horror movies of all time, he was a pedophile. You probably didn't know that, but it's true. So let's get back into this story. So this guy, Psycho Sam, a.k.a. real name Richard McCroskey, grew up in the Bay Area of California. You know, there's really not much to this kid. I mean, in school, he was a nerd. Uh, he was picked on by his fellow high school classmates because he was a little bit overweight, uh, red hair. Uh, that's going to stand out. That's going to make kids pick on you. You know, hey, listen, we all go through it at the end of the day. We all go through uh, being picked on. Sometimes we do the picking on and then, you know, you take it in stride and you move on with your life. You get into the real world and hey, guess what? You'll still be picked on. <laughs> There's bullies everywhere. So this kid would get picked on, bullied, harassed, whatever. So... He didn't have too many friends and you know he kind of hung out in his house a lot and he got into that genre of music horrorcore and back in those days back in the uh 2006s sevens and eights myspace was still a pretty big thing back in those days facebook was around but facebook was really for like college students and then that such thing so on MySpace, this guy, going by the name of Psycho Sam, meets up with a girl via the internet, of course, by the name of Emma Niederbrock. Now, at the time that they started chatting with each other, Psycho Sam was about 19, 20 years old, and Emma was about 15, 16 or so. They were both into horrorcore music, Psycho Sam being a musician, Emma being younger and being a big fan of the genre of music. Uh, they developed a, some kind of a uh, relationship online through MySpace. Now, they talked every day for probably about a year or so. So in September of 2009, there's a huge horrorcore festival occurring up in Michigan, which is about a 10 to an 11 hour drive from here. And Emma really wants to go to this uh, 
concert, this festival, if you will. And she tells Psycho Sam, she says, hey, you should totally like come out here. We should meet and then we'll go up there together. My parents will take me. Now Emma's parents, Deborah Kelly and Mark Niederbrock, they had both divorced previously. Emma was living with her mother at the time. Her mother was a professor of, I believe, sociology and criminal justice uh, at the Longwood University, which I believe is right down the street, actually right over those trees over there. So the mother and father, they knew that she was talking to this guy that she really liked. They also knew that he was a little bit older than her. At the time of them meeting up, he, he was going to be already 20 years old. She's 16. Eh, you know, some girls mature faster than others. Boys are going to be nerds. So sometimes a 16-year-old dude and a 20-year-old girl, sometimes, you know, maybe they mentally meet somewhere in the middle. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a Dr. Phil, so I have no idea. Moving along. So... Emma posts on her MySpace. She posts this. And just as he's about to come out here to meet her. She's excited. She cannot wait to see if she posts. Next time you check your MySpace, you'll be at my house. I love you so much, baby. Okay. All right. Who knows what they're going to do when they meet up, right? So, <laughs> this guy... Sam, Psycho Sam. So he heads out to Virginia. I believe he flew out here. And he finally meets Emma after after meeting, you know, after talking for a year online. Wow, they finally get to meet, right? And as soon as Emma sees him, she's like, what the hell? He does not look like the pictures that he had on his MySpace. He does not look anything like his pictures on MySpace. First of all, he looks a lot younger than his 20 years, which, you know, that's supposed to be a good thing, but not according to Amanita Brock. And here was the here was the one that really bothered her. He was kind of fat. Let's just call it what it is. It's kind of chubby. I think they would call it back then um, being lied to. Nowadays, we call it catfishing. Now, hey, listen, you know, we all want to post pictures that are, you know, decent of ourselves, right? We want to look our best online. <laughs> we do. And sometimes most of us are pretty honest about what we look like, about what we do, uh, so forth and so on. And then other people, they'll take certain pictures that uh you know don't really look like them right they'll post pictures like this they'll do pictures like this or like this oh, oh your good side your bad side stuff like that um you know i've been catfished hell there's i'm sure people out there have felt that i've catfished them you know it, it, uh, in my personal opinion honesty is always the best policy but, you know, you got a kid who's been bullied a lot of his life. He's probably insecure. So, of course, he's going to only show the better pictures of himself and post them online. Emma is kind of uncomfortable because Sam is, is a chubber. You know what I mean? He's a chubbet, as my grandmother used to call me. He's a chubbet. And... She doesn't like his red hair. All of a sudden, she doesn't like red hair. You know, the way he combs it over his forehead. Even though he's an older guy, he's still coming across as like this doofus-like nerd to her. So the plan was for her, her best friend, Melanie Wells, and then Emma's parents, Mark and Deborah, to drive these kids from here up to that festival for the you know for the day or two festival whatever it's going to be can you imagine how uncomfortable that car ride is or was going up there 
you got a guy who kind of lied about what he looked like, and obviously she is not into him at all. She's telling her best friend, like, this guy is, ugh, he's just, ugh. And he can sense it, you know. His feelings are probably hurt. He just, uh, he just went half, you know, basically across the country, and he's being rejected. So they go to this concert, which is a bunch of acts that I've never heard of uh, performing uh, in this uh, festival. And during the festival, Emma's having a good time keeping away from Sam. She doesn't even want to hang out with this guy. So Sam's like, you know, into the music or what have you. And she's flirting with other guys, talking to other people, hanging out with her best friend, doing anything and everything she can to give Sam the cold shoulder. And, you know... Sam like talks to her. He's like, "Hey, like I seen that you were flirting with other guys." And she goes, "Oh no, I'm not flirting with other guys. You know, we're just uh, talking or whatever, just talking." Sure thing, sure thing. So she continues to give him the cold shoulder after the festival, all the way back down to Farmville, right here, back to this very neighborhood where Emma. And her mother used to live. So Melanie, the best friend of Emma, drives back with her parents, with Sam, back down here to Farmville. And Melanie's supposed to go home the, the next day or two later. So Melanie posted on her MySpace on the 14th of September. And that was it. So her mother is trying to contact Melanie. Uh, she's trying to contact Emma and Deborah at their house and nobody's answering the phone. She always posts on her MySpace. You remember guys, this was MySpace back in the days. Everybody's posting, 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 kind of like how they do on Facebook. She's posting, posting, posting. And however, the 14th comes and she's no longer posting and that's not like her. Uh, her mother is getting very very worried her daughter is not known to just disappear for days on end she always keeps contact with her mother she's calling the house nobody's answering finally she gets the father to drive over here uh to farmville um to see what's going on i want to say don't quote me i don't know if the family was um if they were divorced as well the wells family but I, I believe they lived pretty far, or at least the mother did from Farmville. So the dad drives all the way over here and waits in front of the house on First Avenue and waits there for hours and hours and hours. He's knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door, and he sits outside for the better part of half the day, waiting for his daughter to come back from wherever she is. Nobody had answered the door so he's just sitting there sitting there sitting there finally he leaves goes back home and tells his wife tells melanie's mom nobody's answering so the following day like her mother's now she's worried sick so she calls the farmville police out here and she says hey uh, i want to file a missing report my daughter was going to a concert with her friend out to uh, Michigan and now she's missing. Well, the problem is that Melanie was actually 18 years of age. So it's quite a bit different when you file a uh, missing persons report, be it if they're a juvenile or an adult. But then again, you know, 18 is almost the same to me as like 15. So the police go to the 500 block of First Avenue to do a welfare check. They knock on the door, knocking on the door, they're looking in the windows. They're checking around the house to make sure that, you know, everything looks okay. And all of a sudden the door opens and it's uh, Sam. Picks his head out, he's like, hey, what's up? And the police, guys, they, they don't really know who this guy is and they've never really been to this house so they don't know who's supposed to be living there. And they say, hey, uh, we're looking for Melanie Wells. Uh, we're also looking for uh, Emma, a, a friend, uh, the mother Deborah. Anybody here? 
And he's like, oh, no, no, they went to the movies. And now I don't know if they did not ask to go inside or not. But again, there's nothing to be alarmed about. It's, this is just a, the police is doing a courtesy welfare check. They're at the movies, so as far as they know, they're like, okay. They turn around and they left. Sam closes the door. The police get in contact with Melanie's mother and says, oh, they're at the movies. Okay, all right, the movies. So she calls Mark Niederbrock, the father of Emma, of course, uh, who, by the way, is a uh, pastor of a Presbyterian church uh, somewhere in this area. And she says, hey, listen, uh, I can't get a hold of Melanie. I can't get a hold of Emma. I can't get a hold of Deborah. It, this has been weird. This has already been well past a few days. Nobody's answering the phone. I'm getting very, very worried. Can you please just go by the house and check to see? I, I got a bad feeling. I had like a really bad nightmare the previous night. I don't know what's going on, but I really, really need you to go over there and check because I think something's wrong. Mark says, okay, that's fine. He'll go over there and check it out. He goes over there and Melanie's mother is waiting for a phone call from him and she doesn't get one. So the morning goes into the afternoon, the sun goes down. Mark is not calling her back. This lady is going nuts. She doesn't know where her daughter is. She's very, very, very worried. Now she knows something is horribly, horribly wrong. And she calls the police again. Now it is September 18th, 2009. This has been almost a week since the concert ended and about four days since Melanie last posted on MySpace. So the police go back again to the house. They knock on the door and there's no answer. One of the cops tries to open the door and it opens. As soon as the door opens, whoosh, that smell of decomposition it just totally hits you like, like a ton of bricks. If anybody has ever smelt the smell of decaying bodies, it is nothing like a dead animal. It's a, it's a, it's a similar smell, but then again, it's totally different. It's a smell you'll never, ever forget. And as soon as... They smell it. They know. They know what's going on. They they already know. So they go into the house. And of course, I imagine their draw their guns are drawn. They go downstairs as the smell is getting stronger, and they notice three bodies. And of course, these three bodies are that of Melanie, Deborah, and Emma. Uh, the scene the detectives described in there was absolutely horrific. It, it, there was it, blood every. It looked like a horror movie. There, just blood everywhere. They go upstairs to start checking the other house and they find the body of Mark Niederbrock upstairs. Okay, so you got four dead people in this house. Coincidentally enough, as they're clearing this house, that early morning, around 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, somebody had called the police to report a car that was in the ditch that was being driven by, well, who else? Psycho Sam. And when the police, not knowing what had happened at this house over here, we're talking to him. They said, whose car is this? And he said, oh, this is my girlfriend's uh, dad's car. I'm borrowing it. I'm going home to California. I'm supposed to be catching my flight right now. Of course, he doesn't have a driver's license. So the cop writes him a ticket and uh, tows the car. Car gets towed. Sam uh, ends up ca calling a cab, catching the cab to the airport. And that's where he waits for his uh, flight. So just as these bodies are being discovered, in the morning, afternoon of September 18, 2009, now it's like hitting all over the news. 
the cop that pulled Sam over, or not pulled him over, but went to the scene of where he drove it to the ditch, he sees this guy on TV because they're saying, okay, this guy, Richard McCroskey, is a person uh, that's, you know, of interest because, of course, the police are talking to everybody. They're saying, okay, you know, who could have done this? And they're saying that, well, Emma met this guy named Richard, and they had went to a concert up in Michigan. So they look him up quickly. They get his picture, and they're posting it on TV. So the cop that investigated that early morning accident immediately calls the police here in Farmsville and says, hey, I said, I, I, I was dealing with that guy earlier this morning. I, he left the scene. I gave him a ticket, and right now he's probably at the airport. He's waiting to, to catch his flight back to California. So the police immediately rush and to contact the Richmond Police Department. They said, this guy right here, he's 20 years old. His name is Richard McCroskey. We want this guy. This guy suspected uh, in the murders of the, of the family over on First Avenue in Farmville. They go to the airport and they see Sam sleeping. And they approach him, wake him up. Tell him to stand up, put his hands behind his back. You're under arrest. At first, I believe they charged him with the murder of Mark Niederbrock. And then later, they charged him with the other murders as well. And this house right here is where the murders occurred. This is where... Four people were brutally murdered, beaten to death with a hammer. The sun is not uh, being good to me right now, but I'm trying to show the house. And somebody lives in it right now. Terrible quadruple murder occurred in that house right there. Always try to be careful about when I'm filming at houses if their doors are open because I don't want anybody to see me. And I don't want anybody calling the cops on me or whatever, but of course this is a better angle of the house right there. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, so, Psycho Sam is arrested and charged with six counts of capital murder. Of course, he got the first four murders of Mark, Deborah, Emma, and Melanie. And I believe the two added murder charges are for uh, things related to the actual crime that was committed in the murder. Now, he's arraigned the following October 2019 in all of those murder charges. And... His attorney tells him, look, uh, you might as well just go ahead and plead guilty because uh, they're wanting to seek the death penalty against you. And just to kind of save the county and the state of Virginia, whatever tax dollars, you know, just go ahead and uh, plead guilty. So the following year, 2010, Richard McCroskey, by now, I believe he's 21 years of age, pleads guilty to all of the murders of Mark, Deborah, Emma, and Melanie. So why did he kill all four of the people, all four individuals? Ah, well, because he told the people that were, the detectives that were interviewing him, he said that he didn't like how Emma was uh, giving him the cold shoulder and he didn't like how she didn't like him, that he had talked to her for so long, he considered her his girlfriend and then she's just gonna go ahead and diss him and, and just like not even talk to him. And it, it just, he said it got weird. So he just ended up one night, you know, the night that he was, uh, or the night or two before he was supposed to leave um, back to California, uh, really early in the morning hours of September 15th, uh, he attacked Emma in her bedroom downstairs with a ball-peen hammer, kills her first. I believe he killed her first. And 
went upstairs to Deborah's room, killed her, drug her body down the stairs, and then killed Melanie. No, none of the bodies had any defensive wounds on them, so that led people, you know, the investigators to believe that they were sleeping. They did not wake up during the murders. There was no screams. It was just ball peen hammer to the head and the face and very, very brutal crime. And Psycho Sam stayed in the house with those bodies for the better part of two days. And then when Mark comes over to check on his daughter and his wife and Melanie, uh, he, he goes upstairs and Sam attacked him, kills him, stayed with those bodies for, the, for those three days, two days, and then leaves on September 18th. So he's serving uh, four life sentences. Uh, he'll never get out. And uh, that's it. That is the uh, Psycho Sam murder in a nutshell. I tried to tell the story as quickly as I could. I, I, don't, I always feel weird that these videos of mine really just kind of go on and on and on. I try to put pictures and videos and stuff like that. But anyways, very, very vicious murder. And, you know, this guy is so insane. I don't know, did, did the music that he was so in love with drive him to kill them? Who knows? People don't normally kill people, number one, and number two, when they do, they, they don't have any really outside effects in terms of, like, movies or, or music, but it does happen. It does happen. And, you know, listen, if a girl doesn't like you because you're overweight, hey, I know what that feels like. That's happened to me. Hey, it's happened to me before a few times. Hey, maybe... I wasn't what you thought I was. It's happened to me. You weren't what I thought you were. And it's not like this kid was ugly or weird looking. He was a chubby kid with red hair. You go to the gym for six months, clean yourself up, get a decent haircut, and move on with your life. But this guy was such a loser, all because a 16-year-old girl, who you're supposed to be way more mature than, decided that she wasn't interested in you and you decided to not only kill her and her best friend, but her mom and dad too. And here we are at the Walker Presbyterian Church Cemetery here in Hicksburg. And this is the uh, final resting place of uh, Mark. Reverend Mark Niederbrock, uh, his grave is right here. I don't know where Deborah, Melanie, and Emma are buried. It doesn't give any information online. All right, guys, I'm out of here. Rest in peace to all the victims. I'll catch up with y'all later. Have a good one. Peace out.